Hello everyone, uh, welcome back to another video. So, um, yeah, the Beastmen are out. Well, not out, out, but, you know, available for pre-order. And we've got lots of information to talk about, so I wanted to kind of... Uh, I wanted to take a little bit to sit down with you guys, talk through the Beastmen, and what we're getting, talking about all the potential problems, um, let's go ahead and start with the screenshots. Um, I want to address the positives and the negatives of this release. Most of it is going to be positive, and before I get too deep into it and potentially go on a rant, I want to say that overall I think this is a really solid DLC that offers amazing content. So with that said, let's go ahead and talk about everything else. So first things first, let's go over the screenshots. Um, quite frankly, they look fantastic. Here we've got the Psygor, which is the new, uh, the only really new monster that the Beastmen are bringing to the roster, uh, or to the game, though he is amazing looking. Um, we finally got our Cyclops monster, which actually took a very long time to get in Warhammer Fantasy. Uh, looks like he's probably about to throw or squish or eat that guy. Um, I love the way he looks. Um, I really enjoy the animations on the Beastmen so far, and that how like their ears have that typical twitch you would expect from you know animals and goats of that sort. And of course, the Minhir stones that he throws at people. Can't wait to see it in action. Um, this image we've got Kazrak the One Eye, a Bray Shaman, and there's a Cygor in the back about to throw a stone versus a, a Vampire Kazar with a Zombie Dragon. Kazrak looks absolutely fantastic. Uh, here's Scourge, his whip, which I cannot wait to see in animation. I hope it looks as good as I expect it to look. In the background here, we can see the Chaos Giant, which is obviously very, very different looking than the Warriors of Chaos Chaos Giant. Um, I'm a little... not super thrilled that they're recycling the Chaos Giant and being like, look, we added two monsters, we did a good job, right? Like, a part of me wants to be like, you did, but, like, Gorgon or Jabberslife? <laughs> um, you know, that's a reskin more than anything else. But I don't know. Maybe maybe his animations will be surprisingly different. I really doubt it, but we'll see. Uh, here's just another image. Here you can see... Uh, I'm Seeing as this guy's by himself, I'm guessing that's the Gorbul, which is the hero class. This I'm super excited for. He is the first hero class um, monstrous character we've gotten and I am super hyped for that and really looking forward to having just a big fuck you character on the field doing lots of damage. Um, in the background you can see stuff like gores with great weapons, you can see some bestigors with their heavier armor, um, we can see some ungores, um, other than that not too much to see in this image. Uh, here you see some of the Minotaurs. I love that they actually have a goring animation where this guy just looks like he had a really bad time with the run of the bulls. Um, and obviously this guy, uh, this looks like the normal version, which looks like it's just single hand weapons. Um, or, uh, dual hand weapons? I guess? Looks like most of them are holding two weapons, but for some reason this guy's only holding one. Maybe that's the great weapon, I don't know. But um, there's a little bit closer image of that uh, Chaos Giant. Um, but the Minotaurs look fantastic. I'm very excited for Minotaurs. Uh, and then here is Malagor the Stark Dark Omen in his starting position of the Marshes of Madness. Which, A, I'm super excited they're opening up the Marshes of Madness. But at the same time, I'm kind of confused why Malagor's starting there. Um, Beastmen, like, never go to the Badlands, almost, in the lore, because there's no forests, so they're not really able to move around as much, and it's not a good environment for them. So it's very interesting that he starts off here, and I'm curious to see their explanation. That being said, I think Malagor looks fantastic, and we'll talk more about him when we get down to the Legendary Lord section. Uh, here we've got some Centigors, which look very, very good. Um, excellent animation quality, um... Uh, they look like they're going to be absolutely fantastic. Um, they are, in my opinion, one of the most interesting units and probably going to be the best unit in the army um, based on what I've read about them, but we'll come back to that. Then here is one of the new mechanics, which is the moon mechanic. Uh, Morse Lib, which you can see up here, has been added to their uh, stuff. 
And what it is, is every once in a while, they get to make a choice. And there's always going to be four choices, and I'm there's probably a relatively decent-sized pool. I'm guessing probably 12 or 16 options, which have uh, different effects. Unfortunately, we can't really see what any of these effects do. But they have this caveat of less favorable outcome or good chance of favorable outcome. And what I read on one of the leaked things is that apparently if you can get the moon to full, so like it eclipses the true moon, so you get the full Morselid moon, um, you get like a gigantic bonus for the Beastmen. Like you get to go absolutely crazy for a while. Also, you see that they have the, um, God, I forget what they call it for the Beastmen, but they have essentially the Wah meter, and we'll talk about that more in a minute. And there's their unique uh, stance, it looks like. And then, last but not least, uh, this looks to be a snippet from the can the added campaign. But there's Kazrak the One Eye with an army. It looks like he's got some Razor Gores, Centigores, Minotaurs, Ungor Archers, Gores, Ungors, Gores, and Kazrak himself. So yeah, uh, beautiful screenshots. I think they look really good. Um, very excited. So let's get into mechanics and gameplay. So, for $20, uh, $19, but though you can get 10% off if you pre-order, um, you get the Beastman Race, uh, their two legendary lords, a side campaign called an Eye for an Eye, and obviously the Beastman roster. Um, I'm not going to read all of this word for word, I'm going to talk about it, but if you want to read this, you can just go to the Steam page. Um, I figure that y'all have better things to do than just less listen to me read everything off. Um, so... Uh, skipping across all this, um, we start with the Eye for an Eye campaign. So this is a compact story campaign uh, that puts you in a guerrilla war against mankind. This is the map for it. It's uh, It looks like it stretches from about Reichland to Hawkland, and it's much more zoomed in, so you have a bunch more provinces made out of the kind of ridiculously large area of the... Um, Empire, which I'm really big fan of, especially when we got things like the Black Pit here, which is a really famous forest goblin site, so I hope there are like green skins and some other stuff on here. Um, but basically, this is a, a small campaign that pits you up against Boris Toddbringer, the Graf of Mindenheim. I kind of hope that means they're going to give Boris like a unique model and not just like generic Empire General. Um, which is what he is in the campaign right now. So I hope Todd Bringer himself also gets an update. Um, that being said, I think this is a really good item to have in the game. I don't know how I feel about it being wrapped up with the rest of the DLC. I almost feel like the Eye for an Eye campaign should be a separate purchase than the Beastman Racial Pack. Um, but I'll talk about that more at the end when we talk about pros and cons. Campaign uh, playstyle, they're a horde army, like most people thought. However, uh, unlike the Warriors of Chaos, they have the Resilience passive ability, which means that your hordes do not suffer attrition from being close to each other. So this is the first horde army in Total War history where you can stack your horde armies all next to each other and there's no downsides. Um, they spread Chaos Corruption, just like uh, the uh, Warriors of Chaos do. They function the same... Um, though they have access to different lores of magic, um, they have two. They have two new lores. Their exclusive lore is the lore of the wild, and they also have the lore of beasts, which has been added to the game. Which, based on the fact that they're not saying exclusive, I'm guessing that maybe. Um, I, I also read in one of the leaks that the um, the um, empires is the new hero free LC we're getting, and he is uh, he is a beast wizard. Uh, Bestial Rage is the new wall mechanic. Um, so each army led by a beast lord is Bestial Rage meter. As the army raids or engages the battle, it raises until a new Brayherd is summoned. However, uh, do not confuse this for just being a copy pasta of the uh, wall mechanic because of this very important part where it says that if your Bestial Rage falls too low, um, that you can suffer from mutiny, which is a really interesting idea. So if you start getting low, not only do you start suffering attrition, but um, parts of your army may fracture away from you and attack you, which I 
don't believe the green skins do. Um, I I've, I've played the green skins the second least I think out of the five armies in the game, but I've never. I mean, I've played through like three or four green skin campaigns to the end, and I've never had green skins uh, rebel against me. Um, uh, or I've never had a wa rebel against me. Unique army stances. Um, the beastmen ambush is their standard mode of campaign movement and enables the army to ambush enemy armies on the move. They also have hidden encampments that make them invisible. Um, then they have the beast pass, which functions like the underway mechanic that allows them to ignore impassable terrain by following secret paths. However, however if they are caught, the ensuing battle will take place in the one of a kind beast, the new beast path battle maps. So it'll be like the underway maps, but it'll be in the beast paths. I fucking love this. Like this alone makes me want to buy this. Um, the fact that they, they're a moving army that can ambush people is amazing. Like, like, ambushing is something that exists within Total War, but I feel like until this release, it was like a rare thing that would happen very, very occasionally. And most of the time, it was because, you know, you were too lazy to, because like, when the AI ambushes, you know they're ambushing, and when you ambush the AI, like, has this like super keen spider-man sense about it because it's a cheating bastard um i am super excited that not only can i ambush people on the move now but that my encampment is hidden and can also ambush people that get too close um i think that's going to make the beastman hordes really really exciting gameplay and the fact that you can hide by encamping is going to be awesome because i know a lot of things that people hate about chaos sometimes um, I personally don't struggle with this, but I've talked to people who do, is that if you're not, like, super awesome with Chaos, the computer sometimes will wander up there and will start, like, like they'll bring, like, five Empire stacks up to Norse Guns, start trying to, like, track you down and pin you and kill you. Well, with this, you don't have to worry about that, which is good, because since you're starting in Astalia and the Marshes of Madness, you're surrounded by enemies. You know, it's not like up in Norse where there's all this wide space where you can just wander around and mind your own damn business. Um... So the fact that, like, if the computer's like, let's go find him, and you can just be like, oh, fuck this, I'm out, and just hide until they go away, really, really like that mechanic. Beast Pass, solid. Um, this looks like one of the new maps, because I have never seen this dark of a forested map. Um, so very, very excited for the new maps. I will always take new maps. Uh, unique post-battle options. Uh, so Beastmen cannot do anything to a settlement. They have to raise a settlement when they defeat it. You cannot farm a settlement as beastmen, like Chaos. So Chaos, you can just keep sacking a settlement and then raise it for uh, the population growth. Um, with beastmen, you have to choose either to raise and loot, which gives you lots of monies, and you get, of course, your um, large population growth. Or you can choose to raise and defile, which raises settlement, gives it a blasphemous monument, which I hope shows up on the campaign map, and it increases the chaos corruption to like an ass load and it explodes your population growth. So with beastmen, it seems like it's the beastmen the, the the vibe I'm getting from them is that you're gonna it's gonna rely very heavily on you making very careful decisions. So you can't just rampage around the map and be like sack, 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 raise, sack, 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 raise. You know, you're going to have to think, okay, when I take this settlement, you know, the other settlements are X far away. Do I need to raise it? Uh, do I need to loot it uh, when I raise so that I have a pretty substantial amount of income? Or do I need to um, erect a monument instead so I can increase the chaos corruption in the area and um, get that sweet, sweet population growth? And I like that you have to balance those odds. And because of the fact that you have to raise... Unlike Chaos, which when I play my Chaos campaign, especially on like Legendary difficulty, I just sit in Norska and just farm until I'm big enough, and then I go rampaging down into the Empire and wipe everybody out. The Beastmen, however, can't do that. The Beastmen, you have to stay on the move, or else you're going to get bullshit for population growth. Like, you're actively going to have to keep hustling across the map, which, once again, is really good that they have that Beast Path, because that lets you be like... Oh, okay, you know, like, I'm running low on money, or I need population growth, and there's some dwarf holds nearby, or I need to get across these mountains to get into Bretonia faster. Boom, you're there. You know, so I really, 
really think CA just absolutely cracked it out of the park with the campaign map. I think Beastmen on the campaign map are perfectly designed flawlessly. Really think it's a perfect design choice and are worth a full $20. However, there are some problems we'll get to in a minute. Um, and obviously the Dark Moon mechanic, we already talked about that. I think it's super awesome. Gives them a lot of really cool flavor. Legendary Lords. Um, this is actually the most information we've ever received on Legendary Lords on the Steam page, which I'm glad for. Um, I'm glad they're not trying to like hide bullshit in the dark and are just like, Hey, it's two weeks before, here's everything. Have fun. Uh, I think that's a much better decision than like trying to like spoon feed us information over the course of two weeks. I think CA made a much smarter decision by just giving us all the information. It gives everyone time to react, be happy or pissed, and then calm down and just enjoy the game. Um... But anyway, let's start with Kazrak. So, uh, Kazrak the One-Eye um, starts in the Tobaro region of Astalia, which is... Astalia is the equivalent of Spain, and if you play on the map, Tobaro is, I believe, on the southern side of that. Um, really interesting starting place for him, considering that he's most famous for being in the forest near Mindenheim. I am very curious what the lore excuse is going to be. Not excuse, but what the lore edit is going to be to say, hey, here's Kazrak. Like, I'm really curious how they're going to explain that. Um, so let's see. Uh, so Kazrak is the best general. Uh, only bested once by Boris Todfinger and lost one of his eyes. Um, you can repay the courtesy in full in the quest An Eye for an Eye, which details um, the famous story of when Kazrak caught Boris and took out one of uh, Boris's eyes. Um, for his magical equipment, he has Scourge, which is his barbed whip, which improves his melee attack, weapon strength, and on the campaign map, it reduces recruitment costs for his entire horde, intensifies the chaos corruption he generates, and increases Kazrak's uh, post-battle loot amount. What, what more can you want? Melee attack and weapon strength? Sexy. Incre uh, reduces recruitment and gives you more loot? Sexy. Chaos or corruption, whatever. Um, but those, that's fantastic. Uh, Dark Mail is his armor that you can unlock for a quest train. And enhances his armor and magic resistance. Once again, what more can you want? That's, like, melee defense, I guess. But uh, armor and magic resist, fantastic. Uh, makes him harder to death snipe. Magic resist is always welcome on uh, characters. And then he comes with uh, missile resistance, resilience, encourage, hide in forest, and primal rage. Which, let's go ahead and scroll down to Primal Rage. Uh, Primal... Primal Fury. Primal Rage. I'm just combining things. Primal Fury. Uh, many gore units have the Primal Fury, which have a constant active buff to their speed, charge bonus, and melee attack. Which is fucking ridiculous in such a sexy way. So if you get Scourge, you're going to have a double buff to that sweet, sweet melee attack. And um, the fact that he gets Primal Fury... On top... Oh, see, look, they listed as Primal Rage. Goofs. I'm not crazy. They're crazy. If you choose Kazrak the one Eyes, you're starting Legendary Lord. Your race gains plus 10% income from raiding, plus 5 leadership when fighting humans. Fantastic. You start off in an area saturated by humans, and there's nothing but humans. Because you're surrounded by, like... Well, there's some dwarves, but it's like Estalia, Tilia, Border Princes, and Bretonia are all your nearest neighbors. And then a couple, maybe one or two dwarf factions. Or no, there's one. Uh, there's a greenskin faction down there as well. I really like, though, that he's starting on one of those weird corners of the map where you wouldn't ever think you'd be starting. That way you're not just like, oh, great, I'm starting in the Empire again. Uh, yeah, but Kazrak, uh, 10 out of 10. I really think he's going to be a fantastic character. I love everything I've seen. Can't wait to see some animations. Malagor is your wizard character. Um, he only has one unique item, which is the Icons of Vilification, which has a name drop of Athel Lauren right there, which uh, hopefully means we'll get them sooner rather than later. Um, reduces recruitment costs, so both of them reduce recruitment costs, which is fantastic. Um, oh wait, never mind, he only reduces the recruitment cost and increases the rank of Lesser Bray Shamans. See, I'm curious if that means that as a general choice you can get Great Bray Shamans as a general or if that just means Bray Shamans that are less good than Malagor. Um, I'm hoping Beastmen have two general options, being the Great Bray Shaman and the Beast Lord, but they didn't mention lords in this, other than Legendary Lords, so I'm not really sure. Um, 
Also, it emits an aura that increases the damage output of those around Malagor. So, if you have, and, uh, you know, let's finish this and we'll talk about Malagor play-wise. Uh, missile resistance, resilience, encourage high primal fury, um, unlock unique skill at level 15, something wicked this way comes. Uh, this confers a permanent hex spell on Malagor, causing minus four leadership to enemy units in battle, and minus three leadership to enemy armies in Malagor's campaign map region. This is a fantastic ability. Um, when you combine it with the fear cause, fear causers in his army, and then try and finish people off with the terror causing, uh, I think chaos giants and cygors are going to be absolutely crucial in beastmen armies. Uh, I think terror bombing with Malagor is going to be a very popular strategy. So the cool thing about Malagor is that Malagor is the ultimate, it's so far in my opinion, support character in the game. If he's sitting in your army, you get a really powerful caster, you get bonus damage to all of your units around him, and he nerfs all enemy leadership around him by 7. 7! That's not a small amount. Fear does 10, and that's considered terrifying. If you throw him next to a unit of Minotaurs for that fear bonus, that means you're going to be reducing enemy leadership by 7 fucking teen. 17! That is ridiculous! That's going to lower their leadership enough that if you can flank them with a Psycho or a Chaos Giant, they'll break instantly from the Terror Bomb. Most units. Um, so I think he's going to be a really fantastic character. Um... If you choose him as your starting legendary lord, you get plus one Bray Shaman. Eh, I don't really think that's that great. And all your characters gain plus five percent movement range. That's super sexy, though. I'll always take further movement. Beastmen can recruit and field two unique hero types. We got our Gobul, Gorbuls, which are your uh, super powerful um, first monstrous character ever uh, choice. Um, they have. A newly configured skill tree offering strong specialization options. I don't know what that means yet. I'm hoping that means that there's more options than just, like, campaign mechanics and fight mechanics. I hope it's more like fight mechanics. I hope it's more like melee mechanics. Or, like, offense mechanics, defense mechanics, campaign mechanics. Because if there's one thing I really don't like about heroes right now, and kind of lords in Total War Warhammer, is that... They don't have that many trees unless you're playing, like, vampire accounts. Like, vampire accounts are spoiled as fuck. Because vampires have, like, four trees they can pick from. Um, which I think it's kind of bullshit that they didn't flesh out some of the other armies as well. Like, why Chaos Sorcerer Lords don't have a combat tree and a casting tree like vampire accounts do makes no sense to me. But, whatever, let's move on. Um, the Bray Shaman is your caster, who can have the lore of death. Hooray, the most overpowered lore, so we know Beastman will be competitive, at least. Uh, the lore of the Beast, which is a new lore that we know very little about, and the lore of the Wild, which, once again, we don't know very much about. Um, but it has Savage Dominion, which enables the Bray Shaman to summon a Cygore directly onto the thick of battle. So, I love how the Beastmen just look over at the Vampire Counts, and they're like, Oh, you could, you could summon a unit of Skeletons? You, oh, you can... That's that's cool. Uh, I can summon a fucking Cygore. Go fuck yourself, Vampire Counts. <laughs> Go fuck yourself. Um, I love that. Absolutely love that. I love when the Beastmen decide to one-up. Especially since they're an army that just didn't get as much love in um, Tabletop due to the fact that they were 7th edition. Really glad they got, they're getting some love. Alright, uh, unique abilities for the Beastmen. We already talked about Primal Fury. Um, though, the, the a constant speed to... A constant buff to speed, charge bonus, and melee attack is going to be disgusting on that many unit types. Ungors, Gors, Best Gors, and Centigors. That's about 70% of the army roster. Um, and that means this army is going to be very, very fast, and it's going to hit really freaking hard. Um, so they're kind of going to be the opposite in Chaos. It seems like they're going to be very, very low toughness, or very, very low armor and health compared to like chaos but they're going to be able to get the fight started almost instantly take very little damage from shooting and just chew people up rowdy um this in my opinion is one of the best rules uh centigors are emboldened so they're they're drunk uh immunity to vigor loss and a leadership bonus that is disgusting immunity to vigor loss now you may be thinking well why is that such a big deal and i'll tell you why the only reason shooting units like Pistoliers or the Arachnorok 
or stuff like that are not completely overpowered is because as they shoot, their vigor goes down. They get tired, which means they get slower, they do less damage, they're less accurate, yada, 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 and their leadership takes a debuff. These guys ignore that. Even the undead don't get to ignore that. Undead's binding can get messed up if, you, if they run around and do too much stuff. These guys also have shooting weapons. So that means if you take the throwing axe centigors, who are probably fast as all get out because they have primal fury, they can just run around throwing axes all fucking day until they run out of uh, ammunition. But that means they are going to be insanely accurate, insanely deadly, and ins most importantly, insanely fast. Centigors, I can already tell, are going to be the most consistently fast unit in the entire Total War game. And I bet in multiplayer competitive, they're going to be one of the most popular choices due to this. Especially since they're very customizable, because um, I think there's three versions of them for weapons. Uh, Blood Greed. Uh, Minotaurs get buffed to charge bonus, speed, weapon damage, and melee characteristic. So basically, it's a buffed version of Primal Fury. Because it adds weapon damage. So they're faster. When they charge, they do even more damage. They have better weapon damage. And they're more accurate. Do, do I need to say any more? Do, do I need to say any more? Minotaurs are probably going to take over as one of the best units in the game. You're going to have to have anti-large. Um, to take on Minotaurs. I'm only glad they don't have Vanguard. If they had Vanguard, they'd be unstoppable. But I think they're going to be like a very difficult unit to stop. Soul Eater, uh, Psygors, any uh, spellcasters within range of a Psygors aura suffered an increased chance to miscast. That means, I hope that's at least a 20%. Um, because if this makes it so that casting a regular spell becomes dangerous, then Psygors are going to be amazing. Um, because, like, you know, you have that stupid death wizard that's like, Ah, Fated Bajuna, Fated Bajuna, Fated Bajuna, or like, you know, that, that... You know, that really stupid-ass Vampire Count player who runs that Death Star of, the like, the Necromancer and the Vamp and the Manfred hiding in one of his units? With this, you can just march one or two Cygors in range. I wonder if it stacks. It'd be cool if it stacked. But you run a Cygor into range and just watch him start blowing themselves up trying to get off those invocations and watch him just die off. Uh, I think that has the chance to be absolutely fantastic. Um, very good, and plus it's on a big scary monster, which there's no spell in the game right now that can kill giants very successfully. Um, there are good ways to harass giants with magic, but outright kill them? Not yet. Thunderous Charge. Uh, the porcine tusky bulk of the Razor Gore makes for a Thunderous Charge, granting buffs to his charge speed and charge bonus. Basically, when the Thunder, uh, when the Razor Gores charge, which there is a Razor Gore Chariot, and the Razor Gore Herd, which is a monstrous beast unit... Which is the first of its kind, I think? Yeah, I think this is the first Monsters Beast unit we have in the game. Um, so it's going to be like a unit of Cryptors combined with a unit of Warhounds. Um, but, this means on the charge, they're absolutely just going to explode through units. And do tons of damage. Probably going to be one of the best flanking and rear charging units for disruption. Vanguard. Um, yeah, well, the army has Vanguard. Alright, so let's talk about their full roster. So, um, this is where things... So, so far, I've been gushing over Beastman, right? Like, I haven't said a single fucking negative thing, other than I think it's a little pricey. Um, but that's forgivable. Based on what I've seen so far. However, now we need to talk about this part. The roster. So... I want you to count with me how many new units we're adding to the game. So we're not going to count any units that are being recycled. Because all they need is basically a skin change. Okay? So we've got Ungors. Centigors. Gores. Razor Gores. Minotaurs. Cygor. That's six. Six new units in a $20 release. Granted, granted, there are a lot of versions of each of six units. Uh, with the exception of the Cygor, each of these, each of the five new units has at least two different forms up to four different forms. Which is pretty impressive. But I, I feel like that's not the same as being like, 
hey, look, here's like, I would have, you know, I was kind of expecting at least 10 new units. Even if you count the repeat units, that still only gets you up to 9. Um, I was really hoping to see at least one more monster. I was really hoping to see some flying units so that Beastmen could compete in the air and weren't ground stuck like Chaos is. Uh, actually, they're worse than Chaos when it comes to that because Chaos can at least bring Manticores and Dragons. Um, so the fact that you your only option to deal with flying units are Ungor, Ungor um, Raiders. Which, granted, they have stock, which means they're invisible unless the enemy sees them. They can even shoot and they remain invisible, which is going to make them really good at harassing flyers. But Ungor Raiders are also the worst unit in the Beastman Army from, like, a defensive uh, standpoint. Like, they apparently don't have... Oh, wait, stock's a better version of hide. Okay, that's why they didn't give them hide. But, in any event, um, we'll come back to that. I just want to put that asterisk so that I can remember to come back to it. But let's go ahead and go through the roster. So for tier 1 on their horde, you have access to Ungor Raiders, Ungor Spearmen, and Chaos Warhounds. Basically the same as Chaos. Um, you get you have your basic uh, Spear Infantry, which it looks like they actually count as Spearmen unlike Goblin Spears. So that means they're probably going to actually be okay um, anti-large. Um, which if they are, means this, this, this unit will actually be playable, and you'll see it a lot. Um, I think Vanguard Spearmen could be really popular. Um, that way, when you Vanguard... Because if you Vanguard, you can literally deploy in a box around your enemy if you have enough guys. And if if these guys are anti-large, especially the Shield um, shield Spear version, then I think they're going to be super popular because then you can just box in your enemy and if he tries to break out with Calvary, your Spearmen will just cut him down. Uh, Ungor Raiders, bows. Um, this is one of three... I think, uh, range units that the Beastmen offer, um, but they are bows, so they're going to have decent range, but thanks to stock, um, they'll be able to sneak around the battlefield, which I think actually makes them pretty viable. Um, I just hope there's a good amount of them per unit. Chaos Warhounds, th these are the exact same as the Chaos Warhounds for Chaos. Um, they have Hide, which I believe the other ones do as well. Um, so yeah, they're the exact same. These are your Scaly Skin version, that's why they have, uh... Oh no, these actually do not have Scaly Skin, they just have Missile Resistance. Um... Huh, that's interesting. Uh, okay, then you've got Tier 2, Ungor Herd, Shields, and Axes. Um, they also have Stock, which means they're going to be really solid for sneaking up behind your enemy, getting to their war machine, stuff like that. These will be your really good rear, uh, or your really good flank units that aren't strong, but will provide you with a good way to um, control the battlefield early. <laughs> um, Ungor Spearman Herd, Shields... Wait. Oh, Ungor Spearman Herd. Ax okay, they, it should say Spear and Shield here. Okay, that's why I got confused. So, Ungor Spearman Herd. Um, this is just better Spearman. And then your Chaos Warhounds work the exact same way as they do with um, Chaos. Hope I really hope they look different. Um, so far, I've seen the Giant and the Chaos spawn. They look wildly different. So, I hope the Warhounds is the same story. Tier three is when you get all the good, the good, the good toys. Um, Centigors, uh, which I kind of am not a huge fan of, um, because with Chaos you get access to Warriors of Chaos at tier two. So the fact that you do not get access to Gores at tier two is kind of a little eh, but you know I'll let it slide. Um, so tier three you get uh, Centigors with um, I guess basic hand weapons, maybe two hand weapons or maybe just one. Um, Vanguard, um, very fantastic unit. I, I don't think they'll really shine as much as a melee unit. I think they'll shine more as a harass unit, but I don't know. We'll come back to that. Gore Herd, um, melee infantry, um, single hand weapons, you know, usual, or maybe double hand weapons. I'm not really sure if they just say axe. It seems weird that they'd have an empty hand. You figured they'd at least have two. Um, resilience, Hide, Primal Fury, Gore Herd with shields. Uh, and then we've got our Razor Gore Herds, which I'm pretty excited for. A fear-causing unit that has absolutely uh, devastating charge and is armor-piercing, which is kind of a pleasant surprise. Um, so they're going to be really, really good for harassing um, elite infantry, just being able to slam into them and do a lot of damage. They're actually the first armor-piercing unit you get access to in the entire Beastman roster, which does not have 
that much armor piercing until you get up to the very high tiers. So um, I think Razor Gore Hearts will definitely be pretty instrumental to Beastman armies on the campaign map. And then you've got your first unit of Minotaurs, uh, which are armored. Um, the only armored unit, I believe, besides the Bestigors. Uh, no, the Bestigors are not armored. That's weird. They should be. Um, so yeah, uh, Minotaurs are the most armored unit you're going to get, it looks like. Um, I think they're actually going to be probably the best unit in the Beastman roster. Um, because Cause Fear and Blood Greed, you just can't beat that. Best Gore Herd, um, Tier 4, they have Great Axes, which are armor-piercing. They're not armored, which is kind of weird, because in Tabletop, they have the highest armor of all of the Beastmen options. Um, next to the Chariots, so, uh, maybe that's just, uh, they forgot to add it in. There's been a couple of typos in this so far, so maybe they just forgot that. Chaos Spawn, um, Monsters Infantry, the exact same as they've always been. Um, I kind of think Tier 4 is a little high, um, but that's just my opinion. Centigors with Throwing Axes. I think this is going to be the absolute best version of Centigors. Um, just because they're going to be able to just harass nonstop. Also, they come with shields, which the uh, earlier version does not. Um, so they're going to be shielded, so they take less missile damage. They're armor-piercing with their ranged weapons, which is disgusting. Uh, though they're probably going to have pretty short range. And uh, they're probably going to have pretty solid damage. But once again, this drunken thing is going to make sure that they do not um, get tired. So you're going to be able to just harass to your heart's content. And as your enemy chases you, they're going to get slower and more tired. And then when they get exhausted, you can just turn around and charge them back. And you'll probably beat them. Razor Gore Chariot. Armored and armor piercing. Causes Fear, Thunderous Charge, Primal Fury. Probably going to be one of the best chariots in the game. Um, at least competing with the Gore Beast Chariot may be better. Thanks to the Thunderous Charge rule. Uh, Minotaurs with Shields. I feel like I don't need to comment on this. They're going to be absolutely fantastic. Um, probably a very good center line for any army. Um, Centigors with great weapons. Um, if you want a unit that's going to be very fast, will not get tired in combat... If you want to, if you want a unit that's going to run all the way around the enemy's army, though with Vanguard deployment they don't have far to run, and just slam into their back and sides and just tear them to pieces, these guys are your golden ticket. Uh, great weapon Minotaurs will probably be the best version, I think, because um, they're the only version with armor piercing. Uh, the Saigor monstrous artillery, very long range, which I'm very happy to see. Causes Terror and Soul Eater. Um, the Saigor, I think, is going to be the best monster in the game. Hands down. Um, I think the only monster that will be able to compete with the Saigor is the uh, Terrorgeist. Other than that, though, I think the Saigor is going to be dominating that play field. Um, he's not armored, so you're going to be able to... like. So, notice that. Um, he's, he's not armored, so you're going to be able to mow him down with like regular units. And Slayers will be fantastic for dealing with him and stuff like that. Um, so he's not like the Arachnorok where he can take as much punishment. But um, I'm curious if he has the same leadership as a giant or if his leadership is more akin to the Arachnorok and Terrorgeist. Um, if he's easier to break than a giant, then he might be like... he. I think that might be more balanced, but honestly I could easily see him either way and would be more than happy to have... A super reliant one. I, I feel like he needs to be reliant since he's going to be your artillery. But, um, yeah. He's going to be awesome for people like me that really like artillery units. But find them very frustrating to defend. This, I have now the fastest moving artillery. Who is also the most dangerous artillery. And causes terror in the entire game. And he also fucks up enemy wizards. So, he, absolutely beautiful model. The Saigor, I could not give greater a standing ovation to. And then finally, uh, last and kind of least, the uh, Chaos Giant is just a giant. Um, note, though, the Saigor is not armor-piercing in close combat. Uh, probably, I, I, yeah, you figure he would be if he's using his boulder to, like, smack people around. Alright, so that's the Beastman roster. So, keeping all of that in mind, um, we've talked for a good couple minutes now. Um, do I think... What do I... So, overall... Do I think this is a good release? Yes, yes, and more yes. I stamp this with 
Sotex positive stamp of approval of this is a fantastic release. However, I have a few complaints. My first issue with this DLC is that the Beastman roster is kind of lackluster. It's not bad, but it's not great. Um, I get one new monster, and he's right there. This this is not new. Like, sure, I guess it looks okay, but this this is not new. It's going to be the exact same experience as playing every other giant. Um, I really, really would have appreciated a Jabber Slythe or a Gorgon, um, in addition to what I got. Um, I think as far as the ground units with, they covered all bases, and they're fine, honestly. Uh, it just kind of goes to show how not big the Beastman roster is. The only thing they're really missing from the Beastman book is the monsters, um, harpies, which I think would have been a fantastic addition. Really upset not to see harpies in the game yet. Um, I think the Beastman could have been an exemplary release if they had gotten two flying units. If you'd give them the Jabber Slythe and the Harpies, I think this this release would have been critically acclaimed and everyone would have gladly thrown $20 at the screen and shut up about it. Um, that being said, um, they're missing the Tuscor Chariots, which would have just been basically like the equivalent of the regular Chaos Chariot, so like a lower level Chariot, which I don't really feel like is missing. Um, I'd like to see it added so I could get chariots faster with the Beastmen, but, it, you know, I'm not gonna, like, cry home about it. I don't really care that much. Um, I still have a chariot, and I hope, I really hope the Beast Lords can take it as a mount option. That'd be upsetting if they can't. They also need to add the Lords onto the Steam page. I don't know why the Lords and their mount options are not on the Steam page. They need to fix that. Um, other than that, um, the cam uh, when it comes to the campaign map, CA got a ten gets a 10 out of 10 rating from me. When it comes to the roster slash battle map, they get a 7 out of 10 from me. Because the roster just feels very limited. Um, it's a lot of weapon changes, which I guess is cool if you like to customize your armies. You know, it does have a very tabletop aesthetic to it. But I'm a little disappointed that I only get 6 types of beastmen. Um, really would have preferred another monster and something a little more dynamic looking like harpies that would have really shaken things up. That being said, overall, I think this is absolutely worth getting. My only... $20 seems like a lot. Um, and I think the big thing to blame for it is that right there. <laughs> New and eye for an eye story campaign. Um, I personally am really excited for Eye for an Eye, um, but I imagine a lot of people won't play it. And I don't know if I agree with you having to buy it alongside the racial pack. I wish they were separated so that, like, an Eye for an Eye was maybe $5. Or, no, like, I would probably put the racial pack at, like, $10.00. And put eye for an eye at, you know, $8 or $6 or whatever. Um, I think they went a little overboard with throwing in this campaign pack. Um, it, it just made the price a little too high. I think crossing that $15 line makes people nervous. Um, and they're kind of like, I don't know about that. Like, you know, that's that's kind of a lot of money. For such a small DLC. Um, because, you know, it's it's a big DLC. It's huge. But it, it comes off as small. Because the amount of effort it takes to just make those six types of Beastmen, I'm sure, was fucking incredible. And immense. And they got great mileage out of it by introducing, you know, all this new all these new toys over here with just six units. But, you know, I see a lot of people looking at the Chaos roster, and they're like, this roster almost is bigger and has better variety. Like, undoubtedly has better variety, and I paid half price for Chaos. Um, if you paid for it, which most people didn't. Um, you know, you just got it for free with the game. But, you know, like, and I understand that. You know, 
so those are all things to consider. Um, overall, I think this is going to be a fantastic DLC. I'm very excited for it. I don't want to wait two weeks. <laughs> I want it now, um, but I can't have it now. Uh, other than that, um, I hope it has a smooth release. Um, I look forward to seeing some gameplay on Twitch. And that's pretty much all I have to say about that. Um, I really hope they do a good job with this. Because if this goes off without a hitch and it's like it works really good when you get it and the extra campaign they have is really fun and exciting and has like a bunch of unique events and like the computer acts a lot differently thanks to the smaller map and like all this stuff. If this feels like a different game, I think that the $20 will be absolutely worth it and that people will be clamoring and excited for the next race. I think I think the success of this DLC rides on the NI for an eye campaign. Because I think if this flops and it's just like, oh, this is basically just the same thing and there's just less map and less factions and this is boring. Like if that's what happens, then I think this game is I, I think future DLC are gonna receive a lot of criticism. And they might not sell as well as I want them to sell. Um, because we already know they've started on the second game. You know, for Total War Warhammer. We know Total War Warhammer 2 is already on, in production. And every time one of these DLCs like explodes in sales, that's more money. You know? That's more toys, that's more races, that's more models, that's all that. That's the way I look at it. Um, which is probably very greedy. Um, in the end, I, I, I have already pre-ordered it. I can say that shamelessly. Um, I, I'm more than happy to pre-order it. I hesitated at first, but after looking at... I think the campaign mechanics alone make it worth buying. Um, with the Beastmen. I think the Beastmen, from a campaign perspective, are different enough and exciting enough that they're absolutely worth picking up. Um, that being said, I understand people who are scared and people who are cautious about this release. Um, I hope CA comes out and is like, hey, like we know it's kind of expensive, but we're going to bring you some free LC Beastman units soon. Or maybe some like, hey, you know, we're going to add in a, another monster real soon. Or, you know, just they, they got to they gotta throw a little something extra in there, you know? Like, I know we're we're getting the free LC Amber Wizard, but, you know, if I don't really think Empire's the most popular army after release. I feel like leading up to release they were, but I think now they've kind of fallen to the wayside. It's kind of, eh, you know, they're cool, I guess, army. Um, and, you know, like, the Blood Knights, everyone was super excited about getting a new unit. Um, I really think it would be in CA's best interest to try and, like, release a new unit once every month, two months. Um, I would. There's so much that still needs to be added to the factions that are in the game. My biggest fear is that CA is like trying to add in all the races to this first game as fast as they can, and I don't want them to do that. It's like CA, take your time. You know, flesh out what you got. You know, I've still got dwarves that don't have an anvil of doom. I've still got greenskins that don't have squigs. I've still got vampire counts that don't have ghoul kings and I've still got chaos that doesn't have uh, a lot of monsters you know I don't have chimeras I don't have slaughter brutes I don't have mutal vortex beasts you know I've still got uh, you know there's, there's still a lot missing um, and I think that needs to be a priority but that's just one man's opinion I am not God um, obviously everyone's uh, many people's opinion is just as valid as mine my dollar is no more important than yours so feel free to let me know down in the comment section below a if you decided to pre-order this and b what your thoughts are on it, on, are on it. I, I, have some, I cannot get over how sexy the psych or is and by sexy i mean hideous but i mean that's just fantastic looking very excited for the new battle maps as well so i think that'll pretty much wrap us up for today um i think other than that um we'll just have to see how it goes um I believe they are showing off some content tomorrow, I think. 
15th? Um, don't quote me on that. Check Reddit. Um, so I hope to see some of you guys in the Twitch live stream when that happens. I'll certainly be there. Um, yeah. Please, guys, take care of yourselves. Um, if you're... Just quick to sign out if you're in France. I hope you're okay. And I'm sorry for a rough day for um, your country. Happy Bastille Day. I hope you had as good of a day as you could have. And um, in light of these dark times, you uh, stay close to your friends and family. Um, outside of that, um, hope everyone's having a fantastic day. Um, I'm super excited for Beastmen. Can't wait to have them. Call the Beastmen. I hear it, man. I hear it. My wallet's already stuck to the screen. Thanks for watching, guys. I'll... See you next time.